Hello, this is the fourth in a series of five lectures about survey research in the digital age. It covers chapter three of Bit by Bit. So as you remember in the first video, I talked about the third era of survey research. And in this video, I'll talk about one part of that, the data environment and how I think the third era of survey research will be a linked era of da a data environment. Um, what I mean by that is in the past surveys were often standalone activities and increasingly I think we will be designing surveys explicitly to link to all of the big data sources that exist. So one question I'm often asked about surveys uh, uh, is will big data kill surveys? And the answer here is definitely not, no. Um, it will not. And the reason why is because I think sometimes people think of them as substitutes, but I think it's much better to think of them as complements. Two things that as you have more of one, you want more of the other. So I think a better model for how you should think about surveys and big data is peanut butter and jelly. Um, so for all the Americans uh, watching this video, you know that peanut butter and jelly are delicious together. Um, if you did not grow up eating peanut butter and jelly in your school lunch, you might think it's a strange combination, um, but you should definitely try it. Um, so the more peanut butter you have, the more jelly you want. And the more jelly you have, the more peanut butter you want. They're complements, they're not substitutes. And so I think the best way to think about the relationship between surveys and big data is like peanut butter and jelly. So how are these two things like peanut butter and jelly? I think there's two ways that we can, two kind of templates that we can imagine using when we're linking together uh, surveys and big data sources. The first is called enriched asking that I call enriched asking and the second I call amplified asking. And there's a difference in these two approaches on the role of the big data and um, how the big data and the survey data are connected together. So in enriched asking over here, um, you have a big data source, you have a survey and you link them together. So this step in, of record linkage is very important, making sure that the people in the survey and the people in the big data line up and you can connect their records. The second way uh, model for co co connecting big data and survey data is what I call amplified asking. So you have some big data source and you have some survey data and you use a, you, you train a model, a machine learning model to predict the survey data based on the big data source. So for example, you might try to predict someone's wealth based on their mobile phone call records. Then you would use that model to then predict or uh, the answers to the surveys for all of the people in the entire big data source. And then what you would end up using is the survey data and the imputed survey data in your analysis. So in the amplified asking model, you end up not using the big data source at all, except as a way to amplify the survey data. So this means you can actually use a huge range of data sources um, in this amplified asking structure. It doesn't even need to be something that's actually related to what you want to study. So long as you can build a model to predict the survey results that you want from the big data source. So what I want to do now is I want to give you an example of a study that uses enriched asking and I want to give you an example of a study that uses amplified asking so you can see both of these templates in action. So first a study that uses uh, enriched asking. So this is a study um, about, uh, about validating survey answers, particularly about voting. So there's lots and lots of surveys about voting. Um, political scientists love uh, studying voting. Um, and it turns out though that um, it's widely believed that people actually don't tell the truth about whether they voted or not in surveys. And in fact, there are big data sources in the United States that capture whether someone has voted or not. It's actually public record in the United States whether you have voted or not. It's not obviously public who you voted for, but whether you voted or not is public record. And so what this paper does is a very creative way of combining the survey data where people give reports about whether they vote or not with this big data source and administrative records 
to see how accurately people are at reporting what they say in a survey. So let's look at a little bit of the structure here. So this is a kind of a complicated design. Um, so the gray box here, this is Catalyst. Uh, this is a company. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about this study is that the researchers were still able to do it even though they don't know exactly how what everything works inside of this company. So let me just summarize the study quickly and then we'll walk through it in a little bit more detail. Catalyst takes a bunch of administrative records from governments, from the postal service, and from various commercial vendors, puts them into a master file showing the voting behavior of lots and lots of people. The researchers do a survey, the CCES, collect some survey data uh, about self-reported voting, as well as some data that can be used for record linkage to link onto the Catalyst master file. And then at the end, they get the survey data, the data for linkage, and then a subset of the Catalyst master file, which has whether Catalyst thinks this person voted or not. So this kind of structure where you do a survey and then you link it to some administrative records and then you can compare what's in the survey to what's in the administrative records. Now one of the things that makes this particularly challenging is that in this case the researchers did not know exactly how Catalyst takes all of these data files and creates their master file. That's actually an incredibly complicated process. It's very hard to do well. Uh, but the future of Catalyst as a company depends in part on their ability to do this well. Also, the researchers don't know exactly how Catalyst does the record linkage. And it turns out this is a key part of this process. If you're not able to link the, a person in the survey data to the right person in the Catalyst data, you can imagine how that might create the appearance of a mismatch when in fact the problem is you're actually linking together the wrong people. So one of the things I love about this paper is how careful they were, even though they could not control those processes in terms of testing to see uh, how confident that they could be uh, in them. And I think this also shows that there's a role for researchers to work with companies, um, even when the researchers don't have total uh, visibility into exactly how the company is working. The company is able to operate at a scale that these researchers could not. And so this would really only be possible uh, in this kind of, of collaboration. So let me talk a little bit more about what they found. Um, so first what they found is that overreporting uh, of voting is rampant. Uh, almost a half of non-voters reported voting. And also someone who reported voting had actually only an 80% chance of voting. So there's tons of overreporting. Overreporting is not random. So it's most common among high income, well-educated partisans who are engaged in civic affairs. Um, so because of this systematic overreporting, differences between voters and non-voters are actually smaller than they appear in surveys. So based on survey research, political scientists had thought there are big differences between the kinds of people that vote and the kinds of people they, that don't vote. And what this study estimates is that actually those differences are actually much smaller than they appear because the people who are likely to vote are also likely to overreport voting. And then they also show that existing theories are better at predicting who will report voting than who will actually vote. So this is a very interesting paper and I think it's a good example of this first way of combining uh, survey data with uh, with big data sources, which I call enriched asking. And so in this particular paper, the, um, the role of these two things together was to validate the survey data. But I think a much more common way that you'll see enriched asking is using the survey data to collect information that was not collected in the big data source. So earlier we learned that big data sources are often incomplete. They often don't collect the information that you would like as a researcher. And so one way to address that is to collect that extra information and then merge it onto the big data source. So that's a little bit about enriched asking, the first pattern um, for combining surveys and big data. The second is uh, what I call amplified asking. And I'll give you an example of a study like that right now. 
So this is a study that I talked about earlier, uh, Blumenstock et al, uh, predicting poverty and wealth from mobile phone metadata. So the idea here is they wanted to, they were interested in, um, in the long run, helping to eliminate poverty in the world. And so one challenge that you would face uh, in doing that is it's hard to know actually where the poverty is, um, how it's changing over time, in which subgroups have more or less uh, of, of this problem. So people in wealthy countries are used to uh, having this information collected by national statistical agencies, um, but in developing countries where this information is often most needed, it's often least available. So they were trying to see if they could come up with a new way of estimating this information using mobile phone metadata. Um, so here's the structure. They started with 1.5 million call records uh, from the largest mobile phone company in Rwanda. This did not actually include the information that they wanted, um, which was these well-validated measures of wealth and poverty. And so they took a random sample uh, from these uh, phone numbers and the call records and actually called the people and gave them a survey. Uh, collecting the data that they wanted, and then they were able to link these two data sources together. So the first step is they did this step that's often called feature engineering. So what they did is they created a huge matrix where one row is each person and one column is a feature or a variable. So this feature could be something like number of outgoing calls, number of incoming calls, uh, ratio of international calls to domestic calls. Could be anything like that. It could also be more complicated combinations of these, like ratio of outgoing international calls to incoming international calls. So there you could take existing features and kind of combine them together. And so one of the nice things about this study is the way that they had a semi-automated way of producing a huge number of features by taking features that you as a researcher might design and then combining them and to create a huge number of features. Because the point here is that all we want is features that will be helpful in predicting the survey data and they didn't know ahead of time exactly which features would do that. Then they trained a machine learning model to predict the survey data from all of their features. Um, they uh, used um, an elastic net regression model, which is like a, a uh, for, for first approximation, you can think of it as a linear regression model. But then one of the problems you run into is there are very, very high number of variables. And so what the elastic net model does is it shrinks down some of those coefficients to avoid overfitting. So if you're not familiar with that uh, machine learning technique, uh, I would recommend checking out the paper where they talk much more about it. It's a useful technique when you have a large number of predictors. Um, so then once they've trained this machine learning model, they then use the model to predict what everyone would have said on the survey, all the other customers who they didn't give the survey to. And then the last thing they did is they imputed where everyone lived. Um, so they, they estimated their residence location and they did this approximately by uh, looking at where the center of mass was for the calls that they made at night. So roughly where you make phone calls at night is a good approximation of where you live. Um, so then they're able to put all this stuff together and the first thing that they check is how well are they able to predict the um, wealth of people um, in the survey data. So they did that using a technique called cross-validation. So they trained their model on 90% of the survey data, and then they tried to predict the wealth of the other 10% of the people and see how well they did. And then they repeated, then they repeated this process uh, over and over, dropping out one chunk of data each time. So the key idea here is you wanna train your model with some data and test your model with other data so that you avoid the uh, problem of overfitting. So these results here in this graph are um, the, comparing the predicted wealth to the actual wealth under cross-validation. So what this graph shows is that the uh, predictions are definitely not perfect, but there is some signal where the actual wealth is definitely related to the predictive wealth. 
But so all this graph shows though, is that they can predict the wealth of people in their survey data. It doesn't show that they can actually recover um, the ground truth of all people in Rwanda, because remember, the people who are in the big data source could be different than the people who are not. Like you could imagine, for example, people who have mobile phones are wealthier than people who don't have mobile phones. So this by itself, just showing that you can do well in cross-validation um, does not show that this technique works uh, in terms of recovering estimates of uh, what's happening in Rwanda, but it is a good first start. So then the next thing they show in their paper is things like this. These are high resolution uh, estimates of the amount of poverty that exists in very small geographic areas. So this um, region here is a one kilometer by one kilometer grid. And so you can see they're able to produce estimates for extremely small geographic regions. Um, and now you may be wondering, well, how accurate are these estimates? And that's a great question. And the answer is no one knows. So no one has ever made poverty estimates at this scale previously. And so we don't yet know how accurate these estimates are. And this is a problem that you see um, in other areas of computational social science as well. When you estimate something that has never been estimated before, it's often hard to know how accurate your estimates are. However, in Rwanda, a few years before their study, was, there was a demographic and health survey. And so this is a large probability-based face-to-face survey. Um, and so these demographic and health surveys are not perfect, but they're kind of the gold standard for measuring, um, uh, collecting health data in developing countries. And so what um, Blumenstock and colleagues were able to do is aggregate their estimates to the regional level and then compare their estimates to the estimates that come from the demographic and health survey. And so here are the results. So the x-axis here is the average predicted wealth uh, computed from the call records for, uh, uh, um, for a region. And then the y-axis uh, is the um, estimates that come from the DHS. And so what you see again is there is some relationship at the regional level between the predicted wealth and the actual wealth. And so what this graph shows is that Blumenstock and colleagues using their technique, they were able to produce estimates that were similar to estimates from the demographic and health survey. And similar, they formalized that idea in, in much greater detail in the paper. So at this point you may say, well, great, we already have the demographic and health survey. What, how, what help does this do? It just reproduces what we could do earlier and in fact, it reproduces it in a way that's actually much more complicated and um, has a lot of unknown error properties and so on. But the big difference is that the Blumenstock approach uh, is 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper. So 50 times cheaper is substantially cheaper. It's not 10% cheaper, 20% cheaper. It's 50 times cheaper. And so what this means is not that we should cut the budget of the demographic and health survey by a factor of 50. That would be a terrible idea. But if we switch to these new techniques, perhaps we could be collecting 50 times more data. So right now, demographic and health surveys happen approximately every five years. If they were 50 times cheaper, we might be able to do one every month. And so we would not have to wait as long to be able to know how important measures of health uh, are changing in these countries. So um, making something 50 times cheaper is really a qualitative change in what's possible um, in, in your measurement. So I love this Blumenstock et al. Um, paper in part because I think it's the, a wonderful example of how ready-made data and custom-made data can work together. The call logs alone were not sufficient the survey alone was not sufficient. It was only through the combination of these ready-mades and custom-mades that they were able to produce these estimates. And so, again, I think it's the best illustration of this combination. So to wrap up this video, um, it's best to think of surveys and big data as complements and not substitutes. Uh, sometimes we can do enriched asking um, where we merge on big data to, and surveys together to help validate the big data source. 
uh, or the survey source, or we use the survey to add information that was not collected in the original uh, big data source. And sometimes we do amplified asking, where we use the big data source to help us kind of amplify the survey data that we have and kind of estimate what the survey data would have been for lots of other people. And so I've given you an example of enriched asking, the study of um, the voter behavior, and I've given you as an example of amplified asking, the study of estimating poverty in Rwanda. Uh, you can learn more in the What to Read Next section of Chapter 3 of Bit by Bit. So this, again, is the fourth in a series of five videos about survey research in the digital age. Thank you.